is really what it boils down to. We have to forgive ourselves that we were wounded and we expected ourselves to be able to perform on a level we weren't even capable of. It's like expecting somebody to run a marathon on a broken leg. We have wounds. We're not able to operate at our best when we're wounded. We can't even go to work when we're sick. You know, it's like, how are we supposed to operate our entire lives like with the soul sickness that we have? Welcome to Amy Liz Harrison's podcast, Eternally Amy, a mum of eight's journey from jail to joy, a Gen Xer who overcame her struggle with alcohol to become a best-selling author and mental health advocate. She shares stories of hope and offers ideas for others struggling with mental health challenges, spirituality, ADHD, or maybe just family, travel, and logistics. One thing is for sure, you'll leave with something to chew on. And now, here's your host, Amy Liz Harrison, with your mystery meat sandwich. Greetings, compadres. Hello, hello, hello. I am skipping the mystery meat sandwich for today because you know what? You don't need it. You don't need it because I have such a special guest on today who I had the pleasure of being on her podcast last week, and I'm here to tell you It was one of the most actually comfortable, fulfilling, enjoyable interviews I've ever had. So I'm just so, so happy that you're here today. Today we have Arlena Allen and she is, wait for it, a certified life coach and recovery coach. She is host of the award-winning recovery podcast called One Day at a Time Recovery Podcast. And she's been free of addiction from drugs and alcohol for more than, wait for it, 28 years, 28 years, people. And she's dedicated her life to helping others do the same. She's married. She's a mother of two. And Arlena is a lifelong seeker of truth. And Arlena shares lessons learned in her writings and podcast and Here's what's cool. You guys, she is a hypnotist and she believes that getting to the core of your belief system can be altered and changed for better, which is so great and so exciting uh, because that's where the rubber meets the road, right? And so Arlena, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm like so excited you're here. So excited to be here. It's like talking about all my favorite things, you know, helping people get relief from their suffering, really, and change at that really fundamental level. These are a few of my favorite things, as they say. And um, so, yeah, so I'm wondering if we could just jump in and have you share with us a little bit about your work and your background and how you arrived at the work that you do. Sure. So the work I'm doing now is really focused on um, hypnotherapy. Um, I, you know, it's so when you said, oh, it's a belief and, and really be- beliefs are based on uh, my current beliefs are based on evidence and experience. There's all this hyperbole of what's possible. But when you see it and experience it, that is really powerful. Right. That's really what shapes our beliefs. And and I think so many of us are not just wanting to get sober from drugs or alcohol or shopping addiction or sex addiction or workaholism, whatever, perfectionism. Um, we're really like getting sober from life. Right. We're all in, under this illusion of what life is supposed to be and who we think that we are. And so. I feel like this has been for me, like getting to where I am has been like this waking up process. It's really more of like a process of letting go what no longer serves me so that I can live from this place of internal validation. And Mm -hmm. it's been a long time coming, but um, I got to this place, right. You know, when I was young, I had a lot of, a lot of issues. My um, parents had divorced when I was really young and I had experienced some sexual abuse and I was really young by a neighbor and I had some, you know, grew up in the church. And so I had this idea that I was a bad girl trying to get 
saved, really. And it really sort of burned in my psyche, this idea that I needed to be fixed. Mm. And I turned to, when I was really young, I was turning to God. I was, I had this misconception. I, I didn't understand really, you know, the purpose of religion. I, I miss the, I miss the main message, right? The whole idea of the um, architect of Jesus, he came to forgive, right? It's because we all have like this deep sense that we're not good or that we're guilty for some reason. Um, and so I didn't really get the message that I was good already. I There was this idea that I needed to be forgiven because I was already bad. And so if your identity as a little girl, the, considering the experiences that I went through, I thought it was my fault that the things that happened to me and that if I could only, like if I could only have been better then maybe my dad wouldn't have left and I had a great dad. He was always in my life, but he, you know, my parents divorced and that was really hard on me. I years later came to understand that children internalize divorce as their fault, you know, so that sort of sets the stage for who I thought I was, my value and my reference for the world and how I would have to operate in it to be okay, which was I needed to, to, to do twice as much to feel half as good as everyone else. Everything was very outward focused for almost my whole life. So um, I found drugs and alcohol early. I had my first drink when I was about, it was between eight and 10. My mom had gone out to dinner or something. And my sister and I were left home. I had an older sister who's two years older than me. And uh, I thought it'd be a great idea to drink some booze that was in the can. I don't even know where I got the idea or it was like this dusty old bottle that I've never saw my parents drink. And, but I decided it'd be a great idea. There was something like really mischievous about like, Oh, I'm going to do something really naughty. <laughs> and, uh, I remember that first sip of alcohol, it burned my lips. It burned all the way down. And then when it hit bottom, this warmth spread through my whole body. And I didn't realize how bad I felt until I felt really good till I had that contrast. Right. The juxtaposition of those two feelings was burned into my psyche forever. And what I know now is that like a huge uh, flood of dopamine was released. And my brain was like, Oop, remember this feeling. So I obviously didn't become a daily drinker at the age of nine, <laughs> but I was definitely a binge drinker. And it was almost always that same dynamic, you know, when, so my sister didn't drink at all that night. She was the compliant child. But that night was sort of set the stage how for how I would drink was I would drink to oblivion, throw up everywhere, and somebody would clean me up and put me to bed. <laughs> That's kind of how very classy the lady that I was till I was about 25. And that's when I just couldn't take it anymore. When I was at a really bad experience with my sister one night, she and I went out and drank. Well, I, we went out, I drank and she drove and I made a complete ass of myself. I hurt her during that evening. And I woke up the next morning with like that sinking, sickening feeling again, that something terrible had gone on the night before. And I had to go to her house and hear the whole story secondhand because I had completely blacked it out. Mm -hmm. And it was a, it was an ugly story. And I was, I felt ashamed. I was humiliated. And that began my quest. So I was about 23 years old. That began my quest of searching what was wrong with me. Mm. Why am I drinking like this? When did I cross the line? Am I an alcoholic? What makes somebody an alcoholic? And back then there were not a lot of memoirs or recovery books like there are now. There was nothing. There was like the the 12 step literature and that was it. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get past the barrier of the term alcoholic, mm -hmm. right? Like I couldn't get past it. I was like, that can't be right. I'm only 23, you know? And so it took me two. And I was like, that's not the problem. It's men. Or I just need to make more money, right? I really, I really, I really thought the two things that were going to save me was either love or money, mm -hmm. and so I was looking for Mister Right in all the wrong places and thinking, oh, if I had enough money, if I looked a certain way, if I acted a certain way, then I would, then I would be okay. Money, just, men, and mansions. <laughs> you know what I call it? If it wasn't a bottle, a bag, or blue jeans, I was doing it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, filling the void, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, trying to 
look for that exit from the present moment because what was happening in the present moment, I had no tools, I had no coping skills. Fast forward a couple of years, I finally came to the conclusion that I needed to get help. And there were these two guys, I was in a sales position and two of my clients were in recovery and they were sharing ideas with me that were, uh, I was, that I was ready for ideas. Like if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to keep getting what you're getting. And I didn't like what I was getting. I was lost and confused and I, and I couldn't stop. I was smoking a lot of weed. I was drinking a lot. I was binge drinking a lot and I couldn't not do it. And so they were like, just come to these meetings. It'll be okay. I'll go with you. And one took me to my very first meeting and I instantly felt like I was at home. And these people were saying all the things I had been thinking and feeling, but maybe couldn't identify. And I was like, oh my God, I found myself going, oh my God, me too, me too. And they, and they prepped me too. They were like, uh, look for the similarities, not the differences. People are going to look different on the outside, but all the feelings are all the same. Mm. And so they said, listen for the feelings. And I was like, oh my. so I went and I was just, I, it did feel like I was, I was like, these people look weird. <laughs> these can't be my people. But uh, yeah, they were my people. And there were doctors and lawyers and businesswomen and uh, moms and people from all walks of life and they were speaking at a heart level that I had never heard before the language of the heart you know and that's crossed all barriers and boundaries and socioeconomic backgrounds and so yeah so it's been 28 years and uh, my children have never seen me loaded except for that one time I had knee surgery and was on pain medication <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, I've been married for, uh, we're coming up on our 25th wedding anniversary in September. Congratulations. His mates, yeah, he's sober too. He got sober when he was 18 and stayed sober, oddly enough. Um, so we're just super blessed. And, you know, I'm living the life of my dreams. I work corporate tech sales from Silicon Valley for 10 years. And then we moved out to Idaho three years ago and just like living my best life out here. <laughs> super happy doing the work that fulfills my soul's purpose. Thank you for sharing all that because I got to tell you, I identified so much with what you said, uh, particularly when you were talking about the illusion, getting sober from the illusion of what, you know, you thought life was supposed to be or what, you know, our expectations I've heard are like premeditated resentments and, right. um, you know, and that, proved to be true for me, but gosh, I identified with so much in what you said in the juxtaposition of, you know, after you had that first drink, just how bad you really felt in normal life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah, you didn't even know. I was, I was really young, so I didn't know. I didn't know that yeah. there was another way to feel really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm just, I'm so interested in I got kind of sucked into your website. I was looking at it and um, the whole part about, you know, solving the external problems, trying, you know, to try to make changes and then they don't last and why don't they last? And then, oh, well, I haven't gotten to the core internal issue. Mm -hmm. And um, gosh, you know, for me, for doing the fourth step, that was such a big deal for me um, in the 12 step program was realizing, oh, I have power in this because, you know, once I go through this process and realize what is my part, I can do something about that. And that's powerful. And so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about, you know, your work and how you came to these conclusions and whatever you want to share about it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, the four step was magical for me. Like I kept hearing people say, oh, if you just do the work, you know, do the work of recovery. And I was like, what, okay, what is it? Can you be specific? And that's what I loved about the four step. It, it was about being specific about the causes of my resentments and really what it like causes and conditions. And really that's what life is about cause and effect, right? We need the right information. We need to take the right action to have the effect that we want. And so it becomes sort of scientific and it becomes impersonal, right? Which was really helpful for me because I had so much guilt and shame that uh, it was very hard to 
see myself with any kind of clarity. I had no perspective because I was so clouded by this protection of denial, right? Denial is there to keep you safe. It's not necessarily a bad thing. Denial falls away when we feel safe and secure. And for the first time, when I started working with a sponsor, I felt safe and secure enough. Like she got my kind of crazy, right? I would tell her things and I could see in her eyes that she wasn't judging me. And that was the first time I felt seen, heard, and understood. And I felt safe. And she was like, oh yeah, I did this shit too. You know, she's like, oh yeah, I did this or I did that. And I was like, really? Oh, here's some more. I, you know, you test it out a little. And she never flinched. She never flinched. And I did that whole four step. By the way, people are very like scared to do the four step because it's actually a painful process to go back and look at all that stuff. But what it is, it's licensed to complain. <laughs> like you have a captive audience in your sponsor and they list, have to listen to all your BS. <laughs> like you get to complain. So that's what was really interesting um, is that I went through and got very specific about the causes of my resentments. And then I saw how I was being affected. And the one pattern that showed up right away was this pattern of my self-esteem being damaged, my identity of who I thought I was. It took hit after hit after hit. And every single resentment that I had, I was being affected. Uh, emotional security, financial insecurity, all these fears were coming out. I didn't even, I didn't even know that I had those things. I was so disconnected from self, which is natural when you're in survival mode, right? We experience trauma in childhood and throughout our drinking process, we experience trauma and trauma. Uh, one of the coping mechanisms, the survival skill is disassociation and hmm. detachment. And I'm sure you've heard it a million times where someone is like, I don't even know how I got here. Or I don't even know what's wrong with me. Of course you don't. You're in disassociation. You're completely detached from your pain. Mm -hmm. Of course you don't know. Right. Right. So this was a very practical, free process of seeing it all in black and white with love and support from a sponsor. And I was able to see things clearly for the first like patterns. Mm -hmm. You know, I was taking inappropriate responsibility for others. Like I had an older sister that I thought I needed to save her. She had some mental illness that we didn't know what that was. You know, I'm, I'm 53. And at the time, uh, I think I was about 14 years old. And my sister was having these, these problems. And my mom came to me and was like, Oh, we have to stay close to your sister. I heard I needed to save her. And then maybe if I saved her, then my mom would love me. Right. Mm -hmm. like then I, then maybe I could get my mom's approval. Yeah. Um, so I went into like this rescue mode early in life. So what I learned was if I took responsibility for other people's feelings, then I would be okay. Mm -hmm. But I also learned I was not responsible for my own feelings. So I gave all my power away to others. Right. I was looking to men to fulfill, to validate me and fulfill my, help me to feel that emotional security or financial security. Uh, I was looking for security because I was so insecure. Mm -hmm. I was so scared because of all the self-esteem damage that I was experiencing. Right. It was all, it was all connected. And I didn't see that until I did the four step and mm -hmm. shared it with my sponsor. And uh, man, that was such a profoundly a uh, transformative experience for me. And that that's kind of where it all started. This idea that uh, self-awareness, changing my mind, changing my perspective, identifying limiting beliefs and changing them would change my external world. Because I was only, I teach a whole class on self-esteem and the premise of the class is that we only allow into our lives what we believe we deserve on a subconscious level. And what most people don't realize is their beliefs are adopted from their parents or from their childlike frame of reference. And we adopt those as beliefs. And then we experience something called confirmation bias, where we then look for the information that supports our presupposition and we reject any other information. This is not true. You see it in politics yeah. all the time. That's my favorite example. But, uh, and I'll give you one example. So if I went to my mom excited about something and wanted to share something with her and she snapped at me, I walked, would walk away from that experience feeling like she didn't love me. 
I didn't, I, that's the perspective of a child. But now then I made, but I made a decision about who I thought I was. That's like letting a six-year-old det- determine your life, right? Like, right. <laughs> I couldn't do that. That's insanity. But that's what happens is like, we come to these conclusions. Our minds are like story making machines. It's like, oh, she snapped at me. That must mean that she doesn't love me. That's the story I came up with her. I'm not good enough. Or what I said to her wasn't right or mm-hmm. whatever. And so the belief became that I'm not good enough. What I didn't know was that my mom had a really hard day at work and she was exhausted and she was tired and she was frustrated with me for some reason or whatever. And she, she didn't know how to take care of herself and she was tapped out. And so I just approached her at the wrong time and she snapped. And did she, did that mean that she didn't love me? No, it meant she was tired. Mm-hmm. She was having a bad day, but I internalized that something you know what I mean so that's that's the whole thing about when we get sober sobriety is just the beginning by the way it's not that it's like it's just the beginning right. and so these are the things that we sort of discover in sobriety it's we go back and we can reframe those experiences right. with context and perspective and it it heals us it is amazing I I love that you talked about you know the confirmation of those beliefs too. I mean, I was trying, I was having a conversation with my daughter the other day and I was trying to explain to her, you know, when you got this idea in your head of what's going on with a situation, even when you're making it up and it's not even based on truth, it's like everything that happens, then you can, you know, put that through that lens and then it's like, oh yeah, see, right. Right. Mm-hmm. And it's just like throwing gasoline on a fire, you know, and stoking it up. And um, yeah, I'm just I'm I'm overwhelmed with the idea that, uh, you know, we can avoid that. We can change that narrative, you know. Well, that is well, that is the idea is that we can change. Yeah. Right. And we need each other. We need outside perspective. The thing about emotion is, is that it colors our perspective. We've all done it when we've been really angry with somebody. We say things we don't mean, right? Because we're looking at things through this lens of anger, let's say. And so we say things we don't mean. And then when we calm down, we're like, oh, I don't really mean that. I don't really believe that, you know, but the emotion colors our perspective. And so I've had the experience, especially early in recovery, where I would go to my spiritual advisor, my sponsor, whoever. And air and run something by them, like run a scenario. This is like what's going on with my boyfriend, and this is what what's happening. And and they're not emotional, so that they can they have a clearer perspective of what's really going on. That I can't see it when I'm emotional, right? So that's one of the reasons why we need each other. And we will have all experienced it when we have a friend come to us and they're like, and they're describing a situation or. They're complaining about somebody and we can see it clear as day what they need to do. Right. right? They can't see it because they're in it. Right. But that's, that's why we need each other is because we're not all crazy at the same time. <laughs> do you know, this is so fascinating to me. I, I was in rehab with my case manager and I was complaining about something, telling her, you know, my background and she's just writing down all of these themes and Mm -hmm. I was like how are you doing this why how are you pulling that out of what I'm saying I I just couldn't even conceptualize you know and she's like well you have problems with emotional abandonment and this that and the other thing and I'm like what do you know are you serious how did you know anything about me and I kind of got a little bit like and now I do the same thing with my sponsees is I can hear them you know I can hear the stuff mostly because I have it myself at some level, but it's just yeah. fascinating. Yeah. I it's love really it. interesting are the questions. Yeah. Ask people, um, you know, we can see it and it's tempting to give somebody the bottom line, like, Oh, this is what's happening. And, yeah. and they're like, how did you even get to that? Right. So it's important to go through the process right? There might be an acknowledgement or a realization of the character defect, but unless you go through the process, it's hard to figure out how people come to conclusions. Yeah. And so it's the questions. It's like, um, I had a scenario where somebody was sharing, um, they're like, this person, this other person has lost like 14 different relationships 
because of their behavior and they don't see it. It's, it's like, well, you can ask that person, what do they think the common denominator is? Hmm. What is the common den- dom- denominator in all these relationships? Is it you? <laughs> Are you the common denominator? Uh-huh. Maybe it's not everybody else. Maybe it's you. <laughs> you know, it's like, because <laughs> I had that experience too. It's like, okay, in my dating life, I was basically just repeating the same. I like dated the same guy. He just had a different face. <laughs> so, different costume. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, different costume. It never occurred to me. I was picking people that were emotionally unavailable because I was afraid somebody would act. True int- intimacy means and to me, you see, right. And I was, I hated who I was. So I was terrified of anybody really seeing me because then they would instantly reject me. But I, that was all subconscious. Like I didn't realize that that was what was going on Mm. until I got in touch with this idea that, uh, you know, when I did the inventory and saw that my self-esteem was taking all these hits, um, you know, of course I was picking men that were emotionally unavailable because then it was not my fault. Like I didn't have to take responsibility for my feelings. It was their fault. Right. Living in this victim mode because right. it was at the effect of life, not the cause. I didn't see that I picked them. There's this idea that's like, people are like, I've heard women say, oh my God, I keep meeting all these assholes. And I'm like, it's not that you're meeting these assholes. It's you're, you keep giving them your phone number. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's the problem. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And how did you start to rebuild the self esteem? I'm an all or nothing kind of girl. So when I discovered the 12 step program, I was in it to win it. And somebody early on, I'm super competitive. And early on, somebody was like, oh, they say only one in a hundred make it. And I was like, that is going to be me. <laughs> it's like the gauntlet was set. And I was like, I'm in it. So and they said to attack it with the same intensity that you saw drugs and alcohol. So I was like, okay, that's with everything that I am. So I, I just gave it my all. And, um, and that's, and that's kind of how I attacked this, this whole process and just did everything that they told me to do. I took all the suggestions. And so I have some very specific exercises people can do if they, you know, cause one of the things, um, so I have this, the class I teach is like, it's reinvent. And we're, I'm addressing people who have experienced heartbreak, trauma, and addiction, because those are three things that really damage our self-esteem. And one of the things, uh, and why I was kind of going back to the program is they, one of the things is service. It's so service is a great way to build, rebuild your self-esteem because when you're in service to someone, it's very difficult to look into the eyes of gratitude and not feel good about yourself. Mm. If, you really, if you really truly help somebody else out and somebody's looking like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for taking the time to sit with me. And uh, it's like, oh, you know, something changes on the inside, right? And it's so interesting how we tend to attract the people that we need, like we end up saying the very thing we needed to hear. Yeah. We, we, and, we, and we pour into these people um, it's, there's this idea that you can't escape the same measuring stick that you judge others by. And when you're in service, you're trying to help somebody out of their suffering, right? So when they bring you their pain, you're not sitting in judgment. You're going, oh my God, me too. Empathy is the antidote to shame, mm-hmm. right? As you witness somebody's character defects, let's call them the character defects, we bring, we bring empathy to that and it reduces their shame. Well, at the fundamental levels, we are all the same, right? That's why the seven deadly sins, right? Defects are just uh, instincts that are out of balance. And what we begin to realize is that we're no different from the people that we're being in service to, mm-hmm. right? We change our internal definition of uh, like the condemnation for character defects that we have for ourselves begins to change as we give empathy to others, like someone's comes to me and says, oh my God, I've been gossiping and I feel so bad about it. I bring empathy. I go, oh, I understand that you're doing that because you feel insecure and you don't feel good about yourself. That's a wound. I'm not going to judge you and punish you for your wound. Like that, well, you can't hate yourself well. If that were a thing, we'd all be better already. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't work like that. It, we heal through love and empathy. And so as a service is so important to me because as I'm 
people are bringing me their things that they feel ashamed about, I can see that it's coming from a wounded place. And I offer love and empathy Mm -hmm. and that that's what heals. And then as I realize I have those same things, I go, Oh, I'm able to give it to them. I can give it to myself too. Mm -hmm. Right. And then that's where the shift really came for me was um, instead of seeking external validation, I began to provide myself the internal validation, which really has helped to heal my inner validation junkie. Cause I'm like this <laughs> perfectionism achievement junkie. And, and, uh, I, oh my gosh, I love me some self-help stuff because you read something and then you get that hit of dopamine. You're like, Oh, that's all I need to do is more self-help stuff. Yeah. But the the magic happens when we actually apply what we learn. It's all about right information, right action, the right effect, cause and effect, right? That's what it all boils down to. So that's how we rebuild our self-esteem is service is a great way, prayer, meditation. I know it sounds trite, but those are, I practice abstinence, right? So I am aware that there's a huge, like we were talking earlier about this, new psychedelic treatments that are happening in clinical settings, by the way, this isn't, I'm not talking recreational use of psychedelics like microdosing or whatever. Um, but I understand that there, those are good treatments now for, for trauma, PTSD, like things like uh, psilocybin and MDMA, but I practice abstinence. So those things are not available to me. I can still receive the healing of what's called the default mode network in in neuroscience terms. It's like your brain has this operating system, right? And that's the context and beliefs that we have learned when we were little. And so in recovery, when you solve the drinking problem or drug problem or whatever, that's when the real work begins, right? And that's why prayer and meditation are in the steps. It was really genius and profound that they included that in the process because Deep meditation is not unlike hypnosis, right? Mm-hmm. Hypnosis is a little bit different, but it does take you to that theta brainwave state where you can um, experience neuroplasticity. That's your brain changing, right? It, it, anytime you learn something, you're experiencing neuroplasticity. But what that speaks to is this idea that we can change and alter our default mode network, this operating system that we developed when we were children. And it's an ongoing thing. It's like you wouldn't go to the gym once and expect to stay in shape forever or eat a salad and then you'll be thin the rest of your life. It's an ongoing mental exercise. Mm -hmm. So things like meditation, hypnosis are used to um, affect the default mode network through neural plasticity. We really can literally change our, our thought patterns in our brain so that we can start managing our emotional state because people actually make decisions emotionally and justify logically. So it's really the emotional stuff we need to heal so that we can think and act logically. Everybody knows diet and exercise is how you lose weight, but we don't because we get emotional and we make bad choices. Mm-hmm. So it's it's uh it's really just fascinating how this all works. So the internal work of Changing your default mode network through things like hypnosis and meditation um, can lead to the outcomes that we want, which are typically in three areas. It's romance, finance, or fitness, right? <laughs> like those are the three big problems people are trying to solve. But those are really surface level things. We have to get to the core issue. It's like, where are your thoughts and beliefs um, leading you astray? Like what needs to be healed? What is, where it's the thought? or belief system that is blocking you from achieving what you want in sobriety. That's incredible. I think that the whole idea of changing the way we see ourselves, I, there's a lot of power in that, um, that I think that, you know, I never realized before doing the 12 steps, opening, you know, my world to some different tools that I hadn't considered before, um, me coming from a religious background as well. Um, that wasn't exactly, let's say, um, encouraged. (laughs) (laughs) And so, um, and so, you know, just leaning into these, um, modalities has 
just created and sparked some curiosity in me. And I'm loving all of this, the neuroplasticity, all of the ideas of being able to know we can rewire. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the hypnotherapy and, and what that generally looks like when you're working with somebody. And, you know, I don't know how probably is different for everyone, but how long it generally takes to change those patterns? Is it pretty instant for some? Does it take a long time for others? It depends on how how ready somebody is, to be frank. I mean, it's, and everybody's at a different degree of readiness. Um, And so I do, I do um, a five phase process of hypnosis. Um, Everyone is a little bit different. So when I do one-on-one coaching, there's um, a little bit of development, right? When somebody feels safe, that's when their uh, defenses come down a little bit. That's when the denial is able to relax a little bit. And, um, you know, I typically have a couple meetings before we dive into hypnosis because I want to be sure that they feel safe and that they're already starting this process of self-care and developing some sort of support system. It doesn't have to be 12 steps. There are many other ways. Um, But then we do something called age regression, which is really interesting because you go back to those times and address the, this is where we really get to the core issue. Hypnosis is about working from inside out, Hmm. right? CBT, um, cognitive behavioral therapy and talk therapy, those process therapy, those are about working outside in. Hmm. And it takes a long time for somebody to feel safe enough with a a therapist to get to those really deep seated issues that hypnosis happens like the induction into hypnosis to get somebody to the theta brainwave state happens very quickly in just a few minutes. And then we take them back to those periods of time when those uh, triggers were installed, right? When they had those negative experiences that made them come to negative conclusions about themselves. Right. And that's in that deep state is when we can do the reframing and then have people re-experience those traumatic situations with new context and information. And it's not painful anymore. Mm. Like I had a, I had a client come to me for, she was in long-term sobriety, but she continued to have major social anxiety, like going into a grocery store or um, into a meeting or social situations, high anxiety. It came from unresolved stuff that she couldn't get to through 12 steps or talk therapy. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then the other thing is that, is that I have them do a daily practice. It's almost like meditation that I have these recordings that I give them. And, um, and so they do self-hypnosis. Actually, all hypnosis is really self-hypnosis because you can't make somebody do something that they don't want to do. So there's always a degree of compliancy. Um, but after, so we go through the age regression phase and we release those deep-seated negative beliefs and reframe them. And then we do a process of forgiving others Mm. and then a process of self-forgiveness. And that is when the magic happens. When we, there are these things, our brains get locked on about our past. And so forgiveness is required because forgiveness is really when we're holding somebody in contempt, which is really what that is, right? We're Mm -hmm. holding on to a resentment. If you can imagine when you, when we say holding on, You can imagine a link of chains and somebody there's cuffs at the other end and you're holding, you have to, you have the choice. Like you're holding on to it. Those other people may be chained to it, but you're holding on. You're just as chained to it as they are. And when we forgive, it's a process of letting that go. So you're not tied to that negative energy. That's really literally like a ball and chain weighing you down. It's like an anchor. And when we release that negative energy, you know what? What takes its place is the peace and authenticity that once we're able to let go of that, then we're focused on the positive and we can better create from that place. And it comes from a place of self-love. It's like, I love myself enough to let it go. It's Mm -hmm. letting go of the idea that it could have been any different, right? We're living in reality. We have to see things as they are, not as and when we're thinking about the past, that's an illusion. It's not actually happening right now, right? 
And so we're talking about living in reality, seeing things as they are. And that's why mindfulness in the 12 steps was so profound to me because it was all about right here, right now. And for the most part, right here, right now, everything's okay. I love that Dr. Seuss quote, in the end, it'll be okay. And if it's not okay, it's not the end, right? right. There's more. There's right. more. So um, the forgiveness of others is really important so that we can be free. And then at the end of the day, we have to forgive ourselves for what we didn't know. Mm. It's really what it boils down to. We have to forgive ourselves that we were wounded and we expected ourselves to be able to perform on a level we weren't even capable of. It's like expecting somebody to run a marathon on a broken leg. We have wounds. We're not able to operate at our best when we're wounded. We can't even go to work when we're sick. You know, it's like, how are we supposed to operate our entire lives like with the soul sickness that we have? You know, these wounds that we have are like soul bruises. You can't see them, but they're there. Yeah. You know, every time you brush up against somebody who triggers you, that's someone's touching your soul bruise. Mm -hmm. and, painful, and we react out of fear and in response to that. So this process of healing, what happens is if somebody brushes up against that old wound, we don't react anymore because it doesn't hurt anymore. Mm. In context and perspective, and we're not emotionally, our body is considered the unconscious mind. Right. Like, you know, have you heard that, uh, read that book, The Body Keeps the Score? Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's an intelligence on our bodies that protect us. Right. And so we're healing on the conscious level, the subconscious level and the unconscious level mm. changes all our thought patterns, our, all our emotions so that we can start, you know, sort of living off this um, heat from this healed place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. instead of reacting from that wounded place. It is amazing to think about uh, even physical pain and how uh, for me, I'm a natural redhead. And so uh, we experience pain differently than some people. Right. Yeah. And um, what's interesting is, and it this loops back to self-esteem, but um, because things tend to hurt differently or for longer periods of time than some other people, you know, there have been medical professionals who will say, well, you know, this shouldn't be feeling this way for you anymore or, you know, stuff like that. And and then you kind of get this like anxiety that, oh, I'm not like other people. I should be this. I should be that. And then it kind of takes you down the spiral. Right. And so um, I I love what you said, because, yeah, it's like the Eckhart Tolle, the uh, pain bodies, you know, of just the body remembering that trauma or that pain and then not being able to bridge that gap and thinking, oh, there's something wrong with me, the person of who I am. Yeah. So that's interesting. We think, oh, there's something wrong. We're so close. There is something wrong. I'm wounded. Mm -hmm. But we take it, but we come to a different conclusion, which is I'm wrong or I'm bad. Yeah. So close. There is something wrong with me. I'm wounded. Yeah. Right. It's a very different than there's something wrong with me. I'm guilty. Right. Or yeah. I'm a bad person or, yeah. Yeah, or I deserve this pain. Somehow. Right. Yeah, which is, yeah, very close. But man, those subtle, those little changes, you know, people think that healing is some profound, and sometimes it is a profound, sudden thing, but it's often these subtle shifts. And it's in the, it's the little changes that change our entire trajectory. And there's this golfing analogy that I can't shake, but it, really illustrates the point that Tiger Woods is a great golfer, right? And there's, and he's ranked hundred makes a hundred million dollars. I don't know what you mean, but he's able to control the head of the golf club and just millimeters, a change in millimeters and changes the entire trajectory of the ball. Right. Yeah. And being able, those subtle changes are the difference between Tiger Woods who makes a hundred million dollars and a guy who ranked is ranked a hundred, whose name I don't even know. Mm -hmm. it's millimeters the shifts are so small and subtle that um we think that oh i'm making these little changes they're not going to matter they make all the difference mm -hmm. and you know what the biggest shift is is learning making the shift from outwardly trying to get that validation to learning how to give it to yourself that is the biggest shift i oh, mean it took me forever 
to learn that lesson. It took the death of my mother really for me to learn that lesson. That's what shifted. That's what shifted everything for me when my mom died. Didn't know it, but I was still seeking her approval. And then when she died, it was like, oh my God, I I I lost all my ambition. I lost all my purpose. I didn't even know that that's what I was trying to do. But during that process, you know, she only died nine months ago, 28 years sober. Please learn this lesson sooner than me. But what I learned, and this is kind of a, it's kind of a weird story, but I didn't, my mom was amazing, but I didn't, and I knew she was, but I was so mad that she wasn't the nurturing mom I wanted her to be when I was little, hmm. right? Like we all evolved over time by the end of her life. She was amazing. Like I was sober for a long time, so we were good. So I don't mean to disparage her in any way, but um, she was a very different person when I was born than when she died. You know what I mean? So um I had always been looking to her to validate my pain. And that was something she was just never able to do. Mm. She would love me. I, I love you. I'm proud of you. You're amazing. You know, all this stuff. But I couldn't go to her and go, oh, my mom, I'm so sad about this thing. She couldn't. She'd be like, oh, well, honey. She'd bypass, spiritual bypass. She could never validate. And I always wanted it. I wanted it so bad for her to do that. And she just couldn't. So I was hung up on that. And then when she died, it was like, all of a sudden, anything negative that I it was there's something about death that clarifies the bullshit, and anything I any resentment I'd been hanging on to dissipated, and all I could see was how amazing she was. And I thought, you know what? And I sort of looked at this idea of the soul's purpose, and this is my earthly personality, but my soul has a purpose. And I thought, wouldn't it be a shame for me to die? Like I didn't want to wait till I died to see how amazing I was, my earthly personality. Like I should be able to see like how awesome I am now. Like I don't need, there's no more improvement. I mean, there is and there isn't, but I'm like, my essence is I am, I'm a, I'm good mm. and I'm loved. I love me now. Mm. And it came from, so my shift came from recognizing that there were all these different versions of me. Every From the day I was born to today, every day was a different version of me. And all those versions of me exist and they're all cheering for me. I visualize them like in a stadium and they're all cheering for me. They're all just like, so that's my internal validation. Mm -hmm. And once I really got it, that I'm good enough. That it's like, I'm still growing and evolving and I'm still human and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But my essence is good and I can validate and love myself now. I don't need, I don't need external accolades anymore to realize that I'm good. And that is a complete different shift, right? Yeah. That, and I, I hope people can get that. I hope they don't have to wait till they're 28 years sober to get that you're good. If you did anything that you were ashamed of, it's because you were wounded. It wasn't because you were a bad person. You were wounded. Good. I want people to know that they are good. That whole idea of the stadium of the different versions of you. Yeah. That was powerful for me because, you know, it is all of those different versions of us who you know, all of the things that we've done, choices we've made, things that have been done to us, um, they make up ultimately who we are today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some of that requires work and healing and other stuff is just fun and joyful and, and naturally organically beautiful. And, and, and all those different versions bring something different to the table of who we are as a person right now. And I think that's just such a beautiful perspective that you had that they're all cheering for you. Mm-hmm. you know, I mean, God, what a beautiful picture in my mind. Thank yeah, you. I mean, it makes me want to cry because um, they were always there. Mm. And I, all I had to do was recognize that all I had to do was visualize it and imagine it. Mm. what if it were true it's equal it has an equal chance of being true as all the hateful things I say about myself so why not why not just believe that there's a stadium of you cheering for you ah I love that so much and you know it's that whole idea too of welcoming all the things not just these great things you know I naturally want to 
cling on to when someone gives me a compliment or says something positive. But I'll tell you, my brain is like Teflon with that stuff. I just forget so quickly. And it's the negative thing that was said to me in the sixth grade by, you know, whoever. And that's the thing that, you know, I'll love. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's amazing. It's because we have that negativity bias. Right. Mm-hmm. It's the confirmation bias. And then we also have a negativity bias, which is sort of our brain's evolutionary way of protecting ourselves. You know, the caveman needed to look out for danger to survive, right? So our brains were designed for survival. So we're fighting a couple of evolutionary um, mechanisms, but uh, we have all these tools, visualization, meditation, journaling, playing wildly in your imagination, um, setting your intention for the day. I have like this little graphic I can send you, but it, it's a uh, journal pages. Uh, they're like manifest. It's like an exercise for manifesting your dreams. And it's, and t- what, what is your intention for the day? What are you grateful for? What, what is it that you want to feel that day? Like be intentional and focus on the feelings that you want to feel and then write it out as if it's already happened. I'm so happy and grateful now that I feel fulfilled, that I'm content, that I'm, that I believe that the universe wants to surprise and delight me. Uh, and then we release all negativity. We ask the universe for help. I have it all in a little graph and I'll send it to you if you want to share it. Yeah. But it is ma- like when I use my tools, magic happens in my life. I was included in a book. I got an, an amazing interview. And I remember 10 years ago, I was using this practice and tripled my income one year. It was like, why do I ever stop doing this? I don't know. It's magical. And you have to have the experience and experience and evidence is the loudest voice. Now it's not about just having faith, blind faith. We need to have experience, right? And that and experience and evidence that is the loudest voice these days for our time. And I love that so much. It's true for me that, you know, when I start to put on sort of the glasses of everything is amazing, mm-hmm. my life gets boom instantly better because I've just changed it's simple I've just changed my outlook on how I'm going to see everything that happens that day and you know it's the little things then that I would have otherwise missed that I'll see and and just be so grateful for you know a two second interaction you know between me and the um, grocery store cashier or you know, the little way that somebody at school um, looked at me and waved and I previously had made up my mind that that person hated me. You know, <laughs> I mean, funny. all of that stuff. I, I just see everything differently. And it's such a a small thing that's huge. But yeah. you know what? I go about my life and I forget and I don't do it. And then, you know, I have a conversation with you like this and it reminds me, no, this is right up. This is an easy thing to do is to choose. Yeah. You know, I get to choose to put those glasses on. Yeah, it is. It is really simple. It is. And then we get so bombarded by and we're pull, getting pulled in 20 different directions. But that's what I was talking about, about being sober from life. You know, it's like we need to wake up and be intentional, like set your intention for the day. What is your intention for the day? What is your soul's purpose? Hey. You know, and just tune in to what is the next right thing. We need to learn to listen to that internal voice. You know, when in doubt, don't. You know, and that's why yeah. we have friends and we can bounce things off other people. And yeah, sometimes it's hard to hear the little internal voice, and so we can sometimes hear it clear when we hear ourselves say it out loud to a trusted friend. Yeah, what the best in us. Yeah. One thing you said that I wanted to. Um touch on before I ask you kind of what your future hopes and dreams are for um, your work, but you mentioned uh, giving exercises to do meditations. Mm -hmm. um, And I loved that so much, like hypnotherapy that you could actually do yourself in small little chunks. And what I loved about that was that too builds and feeds the self-esteem in a positive direction. And because it's like, oh, in a way I'm kind of contributing to my own healing. And I just thought that was lovely because nothing kind of builds esteemable acts more than 
you know, treating oneself with kindness like that. And I think it's something that I, I know that I don't do very often. And I'll be quick to find whatever flaw there is. And, you know, I instead of being like, hey, thanks, body, for having eight kids. Thanks for, you know, carrying me throughout the day so that I can, you know, make a shave ice in the afternoon. I mean, whatever it is, but I, I love that idea of the esteemable acts and contributing to your healing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And when we take care of ourselves, your, your cup runneth over, right? And then you can give to others, but you can't transmit something that you don't have. Right? Yeah. So have to give it to ourselves first. And there are uh, so many tools. There are so many tools that we can use, you know, but really the most powerful, when you were talking um, just a second ago about, um, about doing these changes, it, what we're talking about is changing our identity, mm. how we see ourselves. And that's, that's why I named the, the self-esteem class, you know, reinvent because we're reinventing our identity, how we relate to ourselves. Right. We, it's like a, respect I think the Latin I forget what the Latin root word is but it means to think again and that's what we're doing is we're rethinking and reinventing our identity so that where our identity includes somebody that is compassionate and kind and loving to ourselves mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Tara Brock wrote this book called Radical Acceptance yeah she wrote Radical Compassion too but the Radical Acceptance audiobook I listen to that one regularly we have to we're getting brainwashed and bombarded by all kinds of of messages and I call hypnotherapy like positive brainwashing mm -hmm. being intentional about the messages that we're sending to our subconscious mind right a belief is just an idea that's repeated over and over again until it's accepted as a belief in our subconscious mind so we can actually reinvent our identity by repeating the identity that we want to have what is your ideal identity for yourself what is your ideal and if you write it out, journal it, meditate on it, you know, maybe someone facilitates hypnotherapy for you so that you can really implant that idea into your mind regularly, right? Mm -hmm. It's a one and done type of thing. It's an ongoing process like exercise, but it's possible, right? And that's what we started this whole conversation with was this idea that it is possible to change mm -hmm. on a mental core level. I love it so much. Thank you for all this. I feel like I will be digesting this stuff <laughs> all week, you know, but um, I'm wondering what is, what's your kind of future plan for all of your work? Because I can just see so many directions and opportunities that you must get and have and think about. And I mean, you just are such a wealth of knowledge and um, experience and, you know, it's a, it's something that is, is beautiful and it's contagious. You know, thank you for saying that it is, it is contagious. Um, uh, you know what I'm, so what I'm focusing right now is I have, I'm finishing a book project. It's called the 12 step exploration guide. Um, and it's every, it's my experience through the 12 steps and it's identifying a lot of the barriers that people experience, uh, whether it's, a higher, you know, God, what is, what is God? Do, is it a religious program? I really want people to be able to go through the process of the 12 steps. I mean, you can get it for free. I mean, and there's a whole thing, but there are some parameters that you need to be aware of so that you can go through it safely, which is why I'm writing the book. Mm -hmm. But really my passion is, is about this self-esteem class. And so that's actually the next book, you know, it's, it's, I have a workbook, I teach a class, but putting it in book form, I think is going to be important. And then speaking about it, you know, I, I love, I feel like this, the speaking is really important. I really love doing the one-on-one -on -one hypnosis stuff, but mm. I'm sort of, um, I might, I'm kind of full right now, but uh, it's a really powerful process, especially if somebody has a background of addiction. Yeah, people have to understand addiction to facilitate the process um, effectively, I think. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's kind of where I see, I see myself spending most of my time writing, speaking, and a limited amount of one-on-one -on -one hypnosis. I love it. I love it. Okay. So as we wrap up, uh, let me know where people can find you best. Uh, SoberLifeSchool.com, the hub. There's a, You can find links to my podcast that you are a lovely guest on. So um, your story will be on there. 
and um, it has a link to my calendar. I offer, I'll talk to anybody for 30 minutes, a free strategy call. You know, sometimes people just want to know, like, what direction should I go in? It doesn't mm-hmm. have to be with me. I'm not, you know, it doesn't have to be with me. I can point, there's free, re- the thing is, uh, is recovery can be free, right? You don't have to spend a lot of money. Um, uh, but if you want to, don't have a lot of time, that's when getting a coach is really important. You know, you can have it, you know, fast, but it's, not you know always effective (laughs) Mm -hmm. but anyway yeah so it has a link to my calendar for a strategy call um some people are like can I even be hypnotized and so I have a quick uh test it's an it's called the Spiegel eye roll test and so I can determine quickly whether somebody is eligible to be hypnotized or not yeah do try it real quick yeah sure (laughs) I can take off your glasses okay (laughs) Here we go. Keep your head still and then look up and then try to close your eyes without looking down. Try to close my eyes without looking down. Yeah. Close your eyes. <laughs> uh, Are you still looking up? There you go. Okay. Oh, there you go. So, so what I'm looking for are the whites on the bottom of your eyes. And so if I can, sit, so it is an uncomfortable thing, but you are very hypnotizable because you can, I can see the lights in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I mean, like legitimately, you know what my secret fear was but, that you'd be like, no, sorry. And then I'd be like, I'm a failure. You know, I'd make it about. Oh, <laughs> I can't be <laughs> It's so like I see people, uh, they're they're looking up, and you say close your eyes, and they go like this, and then you can you can see their iris as they you can see their pupils as they close, and I'm like, nah, I don't know. Oh. We can try. Oh it. my word! It took, to I think it took me longer than you just did that. It took me longer to actually follow directions and and do it, like understand what you were saying, and like conceptualize it and do it. Well, you know what's really interesting? I find that people that are the high achievers and the forgive me, people pleasers, <laughs> and they're the ones that have the best results because they want to follow instructions. That's what's happening in hypnosis, especially when we do age regression, because there's some instructions that it's a participation phase. If someone can't follow directions, it's very difficult to get them to the where they need to be. Uh, well, <laughs> more will be revealed. <laughs> yes. I love that. Oh my gosh. Um, here's the deal, Arlena. I, I just can't tell you how amazing this has been for me personally. I know that it's going to be amazing for people listening. So thank you so much for coming on the show. And I just have, I have a rapid fire. This is Ooh, fun. An un, yeah. Off the cuff kind of a thing that I would love for you to answer. If you just have like 30 seconds more. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. Um, these are very deep questions, so be prepared. Okay. okay. Chocolate or vanilla? Chocolate. Okay. Um, good. All right. Smoothie or McDonald's? Smoothie. hmm Dog or cat? Dog. Okay. Ferris Bueller's Day Off or Dirty Dancing? Dirty Dancing. Okay. <laughs> and lastly, Whitney Houston or The Cure? So oh, Whitney. Yeah. yeah that was fun, okay. That was fun. That truly oh. is the lightning round. When you and I were doing it, mine is like I call it the turtle round because <laughs> it's not lightning at all. I oh, love it. It was great. That was a wonderful experience. Oh well, thank you so much. And I just am thrilled with all your work and I wish you all the best. And we'll have to chat again. Sorry, not sorry, but you yeah. know. We're this friends now. Yeah. All right. <laughs> That's it. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Eternally Amy. Amy Liz Harrison is a best selling author, speaker, 12 step coach, meditation teacher, and recovery advocate. To find out more, please visit amylizharrison.com. Keep up with Amy on all platforms by following at Amy Liz Harrison. Please subscribe and review this podcast. It means so much to us if you do.